Hey, there's a, uh, there's a lot going on in the world today, right? We still have an ongoing war in the Ukraine. We had a mysterious spy balloon fly over the US from China. Deadly earthquakes in Turkey. There was a mass shooting at Michigan State. What's next? You ever wonder? You ever shake your head and just think, everything's getting worse. As we get older, I think we worry more about the state of the world. We worry about tomorrow. We worry about our children's future. We worry about the threat of war. My son just asked me last week, he said, is this going to be World War III? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there'll be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then I suppose there's the other side of worry, the, the, the ones who don't worry at all. You know, we look to our nation, or we look to our strength, or we look to our might, or our military, and we think to ourselves, we, we got this. Nothing's going to happen. We're good. We're safe. America's indestructible, right? I want you to think about which camp you are in this morning. Which side of worry are you on? You, are you worried about tomorrow, or are you boasting in confidence? You know, we spent the last couple weeks looking at God, His bigness, His majesty, His lordship. We've encouraged you to be strong and brave, and this morning I would like you to consider just one more thing. But first, I want to read an entire chapter of the Bible. <laughs> That's right, we're going to read Psalm 33 from beginning to end. It says, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the pe plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. The psalm opens with a call to all of Israel. King David appeals to everyone, and he says, give praise to God. In his opening verses, he even encourages us to sing a new song, a new song, which, is, which in literal sense, if you think about it, just, just as, as a literal thing, new songs would be an expression of a new generation, right? Every new generation would have a personal experience. They would have God experiences, and they would create new and original songs that honor God, that give him praise, that give him worship. And for most of this psalm, David highlights things like God's justice, his creative power, his omnipotent sovereignty, his omniscient love for people. 
David shows how God's power is demonstrated in love and how God can create something from nothing. He reminds us that there's no earthly power that can thwart God's will. And as much as there are countries and cultures and religions that try to overthrow God, David says he cannot be defeated. But notice that David highlights the fact that there are still those who rely on worldly power. And he says they're doomed to failure. And that it's only reliance on God that leads to a path of eternal salvation. David says the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. Who is in control? What's, what's he saying? Who is in control? I mean, clearly God, right? What about us? David says, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Now, I'm sure we've probably all seen a picture of daddy sitting in the driver's seat and he takes the little baby and stands him on his thighs and he's parked in a parking lot and they're not moving at all. And he puts the tiny baby's hands on the steering wheel. That's us. <laughs> we are babies pretending that we are driving. But in reality, he's in control. David says, no king is saved by the size of his army. Does David know what he's talking about? Of course. He's been in every situation. He's had a mighty, overpowering army and lost. He has also had a small band of men up against a massive one and won. He's even stood against a giant with nothing but sticks and rocks. And he says, you're confident. Nothing can happen to you? Don't be. He says, no king is saved by the size of his army. Means your military means nothing. Your government means nothing. The size of your country, its training, its weapons mean nothing. In the War of 1812, 24 Native Americans attacked 200 U.S. troops and won. In that battle, the natives only lost one person. In 1879, 150 British colonial troops successfully defended a farmhouse against an intense assault by 3,000 Zulu warriors. The British only lost 17 men. The movie 300 was inspired by the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Spartan Leonidas led his army of 7,000 and held off 120,000 Persians for seven days. On October 1st, 331 BC, Alexander the Great's army of 35,000 defeated the Persian army of 200,000. So it seems even history agrees, no king is saved by the size of his army. But it's not even about a great military strategist. David goes on to paint the point, he says, the war horse is a false hope for salvation. You trust in this army because it has horses? What is a horse? It's a means to make your army stronger, faster, taller, gives you an advantage. Do we have this today? Of course, we have all kinds of military tactics and advantages. This is like a, a tank or a modern airship, or David might say today, a jet is a false hope. Your stealth bomber means nothing. I've seen massive bombers fly over in air shows, thunderous and loud, and we stand in awe of those things. And we say, man, that's huge or mighty or powerful. And at the same time, God's looking down the other direction and he goes, you're putting your trust in that tiny little thing? Towards the end, David says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. You know, with all of the news lately on TV, whether it was this year or COVID, or even as far back as 9-11, or Desert Storm, or the Cold War, where is your hope? Has your hope been in the Lord? Is he your shield? He writes, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. You know, even with all the bad news 
on TV and we say times are different, it's different now, it didn't used to be this way, the reality is nothing has changed. Nothing. Even if there is more bad news tomorrow, God is still God. And God is still on the throne. And he is just as much in control now as he was ever before. You know, there's another great military leader, Joshua. Joshua led the people against Jericho, led the people to the promised land. Joshua said, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Joshua, military leader, said, if you're going to fear anything, fear God. He says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers serve beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says every single generation has a choice. You can fear and serve the God of your parents or you can adopt to the laws and idols of the world around you. The Bible says, then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. That's the right answer. <laughs> but, but when Joshua died, Israel's connection to God started to limp along. And they eventually rejected God as their redeemer, father, sustainer, protector. They committed spiritual adultery. They pursued other gods and other uh, nations' gods around them. And in the next book, in the book of Judges, it says, after the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, that means they died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So in other words, Israel's parents failed to pass their faith on to the next generation. The next generation placed their trust in the wrong things. They worshiped the wrong things, ignored or forgot God. And the Bible says, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asheroth. Those are sexual fertility gods. Why would you choose to worship a sexual fertility god? Yeah, not because you thought that was the best god. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Cushan Rithaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rithaim eight years. The people drifted away. And you see what happened? They started worshiping other gods. And then God lowered his defenses and allowed them to be overcome by a foreign power. A foreign power swept in and overtook them. Was it because the foreign power was stronger? No. Nope. Bigger? No. Nope. Had horses? No. Nope. It was simply because God allowed it. He stopped protecting them. He lowered his defenses. And what happens next? But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the, king, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rathaim, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. After eight years of misery, the people finally came to their senses. They returned to God. They cried out to God, and they said, Save us. God sent them protection. Our rise, our fall, our might, our safety is not about kings or horses or armies. Now, did the people learn their lesson? No. Verse 12 says the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon the king of Moab against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Amorites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. 
And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a left-handed man. I think we're starting to see a pattern, right? Starting to see a pattern. The book of Judges is a horrible record that just gets played over and over and over again. The people get uncomfortable, they fall into sin. A foreign power sweeps in because they were puffed up, they were distracted, they were weak, and then they become ruled over. And then they cry out to God to save them. God delivers them. And then the whole process starts all over again. I mean, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading the story of Ehud. I like this story. Verse 15 says, The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length. And he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes, and he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they said, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited until they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor, and Ehud had escaped while they delayed. How in the world did that plan work? Right? Because that, that is not much of a plan. It's not. Hey, this is what I'm going to do. I got it all figured out. I'm going to go into the king's chamber. You can, are you going to sneak in? No, I'm not going to sneak in. I'm going I'm to just go in with, a, with, a, with an offering. And I'm going to have a short, like, 18-inch sword strapped to my uh, leg. You're going to walk with a limp. They won't notice. I'm going to get so close to the king, and I'm going to say, hey, I've got a secret to tell you, but I can't tell you with all of your guards in the room. And the king's going to be like, okay, and he's going to send all his guards away. And then I'm going to get close, and then I'm going to stab him, and then I'm just going to lock the door behind me, and I'm going to get away because the guards are going to think that he's on the toilet. That plan doesn't look good on paper. That would never work. That's a horrible plan. But it totally worked. (laughs) The Bible says, So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Did Israel learn its lesson? No. Judges 17 says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Judges 18, In those days Israel had no king. Judges 19, In those days Israel had no king. Judges 21, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. The people willingly chose to serve other gods. They willingly chose to put their faith and their hope and their trust in the world. They willingly chose to no longer serve God and they did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. I know, it's not, it's not anything like today. Things have changed, right? They didn't want God anymore. They had outlived him. So... God respected their wishes. He stepped aside. He withdrew his protection. And then bad things happened. Why would a loving God do that? Why would a loving God allow evil? Well, it's a good question. Why would, why would that happen? Why does God allow evil? Well, let's consider the alternative. Why would a loving God take away free will? Why would a loving God remove choice and force you to love him? He wouldn't. So a loving God gives us choice. A loving God allows us to follow and obey and receive his protection or follow our own path. A loving God allows us to choose. 
If we want to live a life alone, apart from God, if we want to drive the car of our own life, God loves us enough to hand us the steering wheel. Read Judges. Read it. Over and over and over again, it's the same story. Israel does evil. God removes his protection. Israel was oppressed and eventually begs God to deliver them. God raises up a judge every time. And when the judge dies, the people go back to worshiping other gods. Practically, the entire book is a story about rebellion and withdrawal and crying and then redemption. It's the instructions on the back of a shampoo bottle. It's just wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. They leave God's protection. God gives them over to their enemies. They cry out. God protects them again. And as the reader, you read this book frustrated. You want them to figure it out. You want them to stop this cycle and to just get their act together, but they never do. Isn't that how it is with us? We all turn our backs on God, even if it's in a small way. And we think nobody's going to notice. We think, you know what, if I just do it my own way, it'll be better. Follow my path. Listen to that voice. Trust in myself. It'll be better. I can handle this. I can make my own choices. I can make the tough calls. It's okay if I drift a little bit. And then we notice life didn't get better. It didn't get better like we thought. You know, every king and every kingdom in the Bible that becomes proud and sure of itself, God humbles. He brings humility. Nebuchadnezzar, he was the greatest king on earth. He had every reason to be proud of his achievements. He ruled over the biggest empire. He had, he had everything palaces in the most beautiful city of the world, Babylon, he built it all himself. Daniel chapter 4 says at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king said, is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling should be that with beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. If we don't return to God, if we don't give him the praise and glory that he deserves, he will humble us. If we were smart, we would turn back now before it gets too late, before we go too far on the wrong road, before we get too lost right? How about instead of waiting until God humbles us, how about until we wait, don't wait until our life gets out of control, how about, I don't know, maybe we just return to God now, right now, worship him now, love him now. You know, amidst all the bad news in the world, wouldn't you like some good news? A couple Wednesdays ago was pretty different. After the benediction at Asbury Seminary, the gospel choir began to sing a final chorus and then something began to happen that defies every description. Students didn't leave. They didn't go back to class. They were struck by what seemed to be this quiet but powerful sense of transcendence and they didn't want to leave. They stayed and they continued to worship and they're still there. Some were reading, some were reciting scriptures, others were standing with arms raised. Several were clustered into small groups and they were praying together. A few were kneeling at the altar rail in front of the auditorium. Some were lying prostrate while others were just talking to one another and their faces were were bright with joy. They used to be counting hours, now they're counting days. And there's no sign that things are slowing down. Hundreds, if not thousands of people have been in inside Asbury University's 
Hughes Auditorium since a few Wednesdays ago looking to strengthen their relationship with the Lord. Revival. Revival broke out this last week. See, and I think we should take notice. We should listen to this example before America can repent, before the world can repent of their sin. We need to repent of ours. We should take notice. Before the world can be humbled, before the world can approach God in humility, the church, the church needs to set the example. We need to repent and confess first that we have gone our own way, that we have taken the wrong path, that we have diverted, that we have taken the driver's seat. Before we ever come through those doors, we have to rid ourselves of the garbage that is manifested during the week. We need to confess the adultery, confess the greed, confess the gossip, confess the financial lust. It starts with us. This change in the world, it starts with us. Paul says in Philippians, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. We need to purify ourselves. We need to walk in the light because if we can't be the light of the world, what chance does the world have? You know, the Old Testament solution of relying on a judge, that was an incomplete solution. Those were men and women, and they were not big enough or strong enough to solve the problems of the world. There was something more that was needed. Judges is a depressing book because the judges reveal that human effort is insufficient. You can't save the world. Yes, our leaders are men and women, and yes, they were sent by God to deliver us, but they're just men and women, and they don't have the power to deal with sin. There was a need to deal with the root issue. There was a need to have a final solution. And that final solution had to come from God. He had to dwell with us. He had to take residence among us. He had to become the redeeming, atoning sacrifice that we needed. Israel needed more than a person to help them with their problems. We need more than a person to help us with our problems. We need more than just to live a good, clean, moral life or to follow a set of rules. We need to be rescued. We need to be saved by the only one who can save us. So whether you are brought up in the church since you were born or this is the first time you've ever listened to a preacher for any other reason that you've ever been in a church, whether it was to watch a wedding or to watch a funeral or it was Christmas or Easter, you and I, we are all in the same boat. All of us. We all need an a God to step in and to intervene. We need a God to deliver us, not a human mortal. And so this call is to the church and to those outside. Put your faith and hope and trust in the Lord and Him alone. Do you want to know how the book of Judges ends? Horribly. The last verse, Judges 21, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The people of God, they had seen wonder upon wonder and yet the last words recorded is the same refrain. Once again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Don't miss the truth. If we do not deal with the idolatry or the hope that we put in humans or human leaders or political powers or military might, we will find ourselves in this same refrain. We will find ourselves living out this same refrain that we have done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, sin has to be dealt with and our hope has to be in something greater than ourselves to save us. If there are idols in our lives, 
in, in our life as a body, then they need to be dealt with. They need to be recognized for who they are. False gods that pull, pull us away from the true God and that cloud of uh, misunderstanding that seems to surround us as a people. We need to remember that good, godly, moral men and women were not enough to save us. The book of Judges is pointing us in the direction of what not to look for, of what not to do. We can't just look for godly, moral people like Othniel or Deborah. They can't save us, nor can we try to be really good people. That can't save us. If we place our trust in those things, we will write this same refrain again. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The only way we can avoid this in our lives or in the life of the church is to put our hope not in people, but our hope and allegiance and trust and faith in the risen King Jesus. People will let you down. because they can never be enough. They're not perfect. I know it's hard to believe I'm not perfect either. I will let you down, I promise you. I am just another person who is clinging to Jesus as the source of my hope. And all I'm trying to do is point others to him, not me. When we as people of God live lives that our first and foremost allegiance is to God, and we realize that it's Jesus that saves and not ourselves or others, then light will shine through the darkness. We will be a people who love God because God loves. We'll be a people who live differently because God is worth living differently. When we live lives that are so radically transformed, not through morality or through following rules, but holiness, through an appreciation of what he's done, then Jesus will be lifted up and he will bring others to himself. I know it's easy to feel defeated, to feel like there's no hope, that the world never changes, that it's all just getting worse. There is a life that you have always wanted. There is a hope that you've always looked for and it's in Christ. And if that's the life you've always wanted, it's a life you can have. And I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son so that he could be my friend and my Lord and my savior my rescuer and my redeemer. Please forgive my past, my sins, and all the hangups that continue to mess up my life. I wanna live my life each day following you, trusting you as my Lord and Savior. Be the Lord of my life. Rescue me from my sin. Save me and welcome me into eternity. Be the Lord of my life. I choose today to be your child, to follow you as your disciple, to learn from you, to sit at your feet, and to love you to the end of my days. Amen. I would just invite you that if you've prayed that prayer, plug into a local church anywhere plug into a local church and let people know that you're a new believer, that you have questions and that you want to learn more about this faith. Find a Bible, any Bible, pick up a Bible and start to read it. Read the book of John, read the book of Mark, start in those books, read about the life of Jesus, drink in all the wonderful things he said and know that those promises and hopes that he teaches, they are for you. The promises in scripture are for you. And you have a loving family of God waiting to embrace you. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.